If you imagine a car weighs a ton, then we have 578,000 tons a year of electronic waste in this, in this country. Imagine 578,000 cars all in the field spread out. And to some extent, that's what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about waste in buildings and also perhaps a different way of approaching not just recycling waste, but um, you see these things? $25 headphones. And that's how I listen to background briefing, walking down the street. They're my leg radio. I don't have a car, so it's a leg radio. And you'll see here I fixed it with gaffer tape. I fixed my trousers with gaffer tape as well. <laughs> I do all sorts of things with the gear that packs up to make it live a bit longer. So remember the phrase, fix it, and put an eye in front of it. I fix it, and it'll help. Now, we have three amazing people here. One is my friend, Veena. Veena Sachawala is from the University of New South Wales, an ARC laureate fellow and founding director of the Sustainable Materials Research and Technology Center at the University of New South Wales one of the world's leading innovators in the field of sustainable materials and an international award-winning scientist and engineer. And before she was doing e-waste, she's still doing tires, over two million tires recycled to use the carbon in steel, which I think is a phenomenal achievement, and millions of others around the world. Next to her is Carl Weens, e-waste crusader. <coughs> That's not ear waste, e-waste, electronic waste crusader. And one of the leaders of the worldwide right to repair movement. Remember my gaffer tape. He's been described as the Bernie Sanders of the electronics industry. He's the co-founder and CEO of iFixit, an online repair community and parts retailer internationally renowned for their open source repair manuals and product teardowns. Then we have Nick from the University of South Australia. Nick Chileshe, Senior Lecturer in Construction and Project Management in the School of Natural and Built Environment, University of South Australia, as I said, obtained his PhD in Construction Management from the Sheffield Hallam University, that's in Britain in 2004. His current research interests include waste management, and reverse logistics. First, Veena, with that e-waste, what do you do with it? Robin, thank you so much for uh, having me here today and asking that uh, such an important question. Um, we do, of course, with e-waste, have the complexity of dealing with different types of materials. So you've probably seen um, glass and plastics and, of course, got lots of valuable metals on the circuit board. So the realities are that in an ideal world, if you could take each and every part of e-waste and reform it and transform it into something value-added, then it would be a win-win outcome. Win for the environment, win for the economy. So to me, that's really where we're headed. That's our long-term goal. Well, those 578,000 tons much of it, as was in the broadcast on background briefing, ends up in tips in places like Ghana, producing the most ghastly fumes and causing 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds mm. the most terrible health problems. How is it happening like that? Yeah, well, it, it certainly is heartbreaking. I mean, to see something like that, I can't imagine anyone not being moved by... Um, you know, listening to stories like that. So it happens because, of course, you know, if we don't understand the science behind the transformation of e-waste in something, into something valuable, then we just always assume that it's just about the metals. And yes, metals are valuable, but if we could imagine that plastics and all the other non-metallic parts could also be reformed into something valuable. And in this instance, it's the plastics that people are burning, and that then releases the toxic fumes, which is, of course, the problem that we're facing. So you can imagine if a technology could create a solution whereby even the plastics are being converted into valuable products, along with metals and glass, then you would really not have the need to do that. And in fact, even better, if you could create local jobs 
where the parents of those kids actually had jobs who were working in these micro factories that we want to create for our future, we would then enable the kids to go to school, parents having safe and sustainable jobs. Um, and I think that, again, would be this beautiful outcome that we would love to be able to see. A wonderful outcome. And Kyle, instead of recycling it, how about fixing it first? Where does that come in? Right. It is phenomenal how much raw materials go into these products. And we're actually relatively bad at recycling things right now. We're working on getting better. But as a general rule, it's not possible to recycle things completely. There's no way to take a truck full of old cell phones, grind them up, melt them down, and make new phones out of them. Would, would you agree? Well, that's right. I mean, you, you need to be able to get the most value out of these types of materials in the first place. So I would totally agree that, you know, the whole sort of principle of the three R's, of reduce, reuse, recycle, you know, using repair strategies like what you're doing, Carl, is absolutely spot on. We need to... We need to absolutely do more and more of that. It's when you get to the point where things end up in landfill is when you have to think about well, tell something. Tell us, what are you doing with iFixit? Yeah, so I started iFixit. We are a global community of people teaching each other how to fix things. So you can, the, the, uh, what I found, I was trying to fix a laptop myself, and I did the same thing all of you would when something was broken. I just Googled it, and I learned that Google had no information on how to fix this laptop, and that was a very sad moment for me. And ever since then, I've decided I'm going to work on making Google better. So you can type, I have a broken whatever into Google. And if I'm doing my job right, a useful page will come up with step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix it. But won't they stop doing that because they want to send another, sell another Google thing? So this is the challenge is that many manufacturers are doing their damnedest to make sure that you can't fix your stuff. So uh, does any of you have an iPhone in the audience? I can go hear ahead, one. Go, all right, take your iPhone out of your pocket and look at the bottom of it, and you'll see the screws on the bottom of that iPhone are a magical screw that Apple invented specifically to keep you from fixing it. Okay, so you can all imagine, all of us have done this. You, you, you take your phone. I actually, I had an iPhone, and I jumped into a lake with it in my pocket. This is terrible. And I immediately realized the moment I hit the water, I was like, oh, no, what have I done? And I pulled it out, and I'm handing, I'm, I'm like treading water, and I've got the phone over my head, right? And I hand it to the person in the boat. And so what's the first thing that you want to do if you have a phone that you dropped in water? Anybody know? Put it in rice. That is wrong. That is absolutely the last thing you want to do. Okay. Good thought, though. That's the conventional wisdom. So rice can act as a desiccant, so it can pull material out. But what also happens is that, like, goopy rice gluten goes inside the phone. So don't do that. What you actually want to do is disconnect the battery. You want to remove power from the device. The problem is that you can't, so I actually, I have, I brought a BlackBerry. So on the BlackBerry, you can like swap, pull the battery out, right? There's a, there's a port on the back. It's really easy to get the battery out. On an iPhone, you can't. So to get the battery removed from an iPhone, you need a special secret screwdriver that they don't want you to have, take it apart, and then pop the battery out. So I decided that that wasn't going to stand. We went ahead and reverse engineered their screwdriver, and I've been selling and giving away tens of thousands of these screwdrivers ever since. <laughs> Before I come to Nick, how many people around the world are you in touch with iFixit and how many in Australia? Yes, yeah, so in the last 12 months, we've helped 94 million people worldwide fix their things, 3 million in Australia. That's good. That's amazing. So how many of you here have used iFixit to repair something? Yeah, all right, so we, we have a good number. Two, three hands going up. <laughs> <laughs> now, so this is, like, the idea is that if we can get easy information on how to repair things, then maybe the easy choice becomes fixing it rather than tossing it and buying a new one. Which brings Nick in. Now, you, Nick, you're dealing with, as we heard, uh, infrastructure, buildings, full of concrete, full of plastic, full of steel. How much potential is there there for doing something on the scale you've just heard with the other things? Right. Thank you very much. Just imagine the building that we're in at the moment. This would easily be disconstructed. Okay? At the end of the show, they will remove all these parts. But do you know that the construction industry itself you know, you've come through maybe via road, you live in buildings, we use infrastructure, bridges, and so on. It's one of the greatest producers of waste, and at the same time, it does consume a lot of waste. I think about 55% of the waste from the construction and demolition ends up in the landfill. So what we're trying to do here, and piggybacking on what Vienna had said, was to stop all the waste from going back to the landfill. Because if it does, then it will be producing carbon dioxide, and then it will have an impact on the health of the well-being of the people and so on. So how then can we be able to use sustainable materials 
in such a good manner. So to cut the story short is to ensure that instead of the, of the waste going to the landfill, we keep it flowing in the circular economy so that we are able to recapture the value throughout the process. And that will contribute to some of the problems that we are having in terms of providing some solutions. And would developers and builders want to do that if they're running big companies? Yes. Sure it's faster just to dump it and chuck it away. Yes, they would. But the problem also is, if I was to ask the people here, how many of you have ever gone to the escape? You might have you know, passed across a building site and you've seen escape. Would you rather buy a new material or would you rather use something from the escape? Or you might be thinking, oh, no, this is waste, this is crap. I'll throw it away. How many of you have done that? You've done some renovations. Skip diving. Good. So I've got some champions. At least you are doing an excellent thing in the sense that if you had not done that, those materials would have ended up in the landfill. So the bottom line here is to ensure that we don't take things to the landfill because of the impact that you'd have. Okay. May I ask you about some of the bigger buildings? For instance, in the convention center in Sydney, they built it, in, and it was ready in 1988, then a few years ago, they knocked it down again. Only been up for about 20 years. You know, vast amounts of building. What happens to that stuff? Right. Because the vast of the buildings that were built way back, when they were built, they were not built with the intention that were going to be disconstructed and to be able to be reused. But okay? that's only 1988. Absolutely. <laughs> but now, think of the Calypso. R with the Calypso, now you see it, now you don't. Because at the end of the day, you know that you'll be putting up those structures and you're going to you know, deconstruct and then to be able to reuse and so on. So for those vast buildings, if you think of the materials that might be involved, I think about 40% of the materials involved could be concrete and cement, right? If it was to be demolished, you'd have to think, what can we do with the materials that have been demolished? How can we be able to salvage that? We have some companies in South Australia that are involved in you know, salvaging um, of the construction products. And what they do, because the majority of the stuff is mostly concrete and cement, they remove all the contaminants like plastics, tiles, and so on, and try and see how the actual structural concrete or the concrete itself can be used into something else. The majority of the stuff normally it's used in the pavements. So the whole point then it would be how then can you translate the recyclable concrete into what it was in the natural aggregates? Thank you, yes. Let me just refer to a science show I did two weeks ago when I interviewed someone, actually a schoolgirl in the United States. She was not even yet at university and yet she was pioneering something to get all of the, say, fiberglass and plastic out of this e-waste and put it into concrete, which made it last longer and be stronger. And at the end of the interview, I said, be in touch with Vina at the University of New South Wales. I hope she will be one day, but you have got a different approach to this, taking it even further. What is it? That's right, Robin. So, you know, I mean, the point you made about a lot of the plastics and glass fibers that are obviously present together. The reason why we make these, for example, the boards in our electronic products where the circuit is laid out, we make it out of this combination of glass fibers and plastics is because we want it to be really strong, we want it to have all the right kind of properties, but when it comes time to recycling it, you really cannot recycle it by saying, all right, I'll get to the glass or I'll get to the plastics, because the two things are obviously so commingled and stuck together that you can't kind of separate them out. So our strategy is very much about saying that if you could imagine that taking the glass fibers and plastics together and allowing the reform to take place so that both of these then react with each other and they effectively give you another value-added product. So what we are now doing is we're taking the glass fibers, which is a source of silicon, we're taking plastics, which is a source of carbon, and by reacting the two together, we're producing silicon carbide. Now, silicon carbide is, of course, in its own right, 
an extremely useful material that can go back into manufacturing other parts for electronics application. So indeed, the fact that we took something that looked quite wasteful, you know, a piece of board, and people usually kind of go, I don't need the plastics, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But to convert that combination of the two, where the two things, glass and plastics, are present together, and you've actually reformed that into silicon carbide, means that you actually don't have to waste too much energy up front worrying about separation. Because you really cannot separate some commingled and attached materials together without wasting too much energy up front. But you can actually productively reform that. So that's where we talk about a fourth R, which is effectively saying when things get really, really that difficult to recycle uh, and you want to bring it back into a reform strategy. So we have successfully shown that you can produce silicon carbide out of a combination of glass and plastics. Um, and that's really where our strategies go to things that are really, really complex. And, and what about that idea of on the, on the macro scale, putting mm. it in concrete, like you do your carbon into the, the tires into steel? Yeah, and, and again, a very good question. But really what it comes down to the economics of doing all of this, right? I mean, if something is economically worthwhile, it's going to allow a business to do something and make money out of it so that the businesses can actually employ people to productively deliver that outcome, then you would say that's worthwhile doing. But if you can make something that's of higher and higher value, so like in this case, if we're talking about a value-added silicon carbide product, then you would much rather produce a niche product that is highly valuable and then supply into the global marketplace, right? Because if you're actually making silicon carbide here, which is then a component, a ceramic component, that feeds into a global market supply of electronics and products, then why won't you do that? and make even more money out of it and create long-term sustainable jobs for that particular product. As long as the energy equation is right. Now, Absolutely. all of you, what do you think about the energy cost of what you just heard? I think if you can get to a point where you can separate the materials, that gets interesting. The problem is that what we're seeing is that products are being manufactured in such a way they're gluing everything together. And so getting to a point where you can separate the, the different types of materials is very, very challenging. I would say the, the definition of a product being recyclable is where the raw material value in it is greater than the cost of labor and the cost of equipment to process it. Would you say that's fair? So if, you, if manufacturers are not funding recycling, consumers aren't generally funding recycling. So do, do any of you have an iPad? for example. Okay, so iPads are pretty cool. Okay, so the interesting thing about the iPad is that the battery is glued into the iPad. Lithium batteries last about 400 charges. So if you use a device or you have an Apple Watch, you use it you know, and, and charge it up every night, uh, that lasts 400 charges. After the end of 400 charges, you either need to toss it away, maybe recycle it, or get a new battery. The problem is that with some of these devices, the batteries are glued in and integrated in such a way that they're pretty much impossible to recycle economically, which means it's going to take 5 or 10 or 15 minutes of a skilled technician with the right tools to pull it apart, and it's only got a raw material value of about 25 to 50 cents is the raw material value of an iPad. You can't get an iPad safely dismantled in 25 cents worth of labor. Uh, and we're seeing this over and over again with, with types of products. Manufacturers are able to get away with introducing products into the marketplace that are not economical to recycle. I think it should be criminal. I think the iPad flat out should be banned as a product design. There's some other products, like the iPhone is actually a great product design. You can separate the, the battery from the iPhone really easily. But none of you knew that before you came here and I told you because we're not all taking these things apart, right? So our environmental regulators are failing us. Our electronics manufacturers are failing us. We're creating products that should not exist. And we're all happily going about our lives, buying, consuming them, and then they end up, up to, with a recycler who's supposed to do their best possible with it. And, and the product wasn't designed with designed for recycling from the beginning. What about the crash prevention in cars? What prevention? The balloon that blows up. Oh, the, the, okay. The air, okay. Yes, yeah, so this is another challenge with cars. Uh, I, I know a lot of folks who recycle cars, and they have the problem you, you crush down the car. Uh, and the problem is that if you crush a car without removing the airbags first, you have a problem. Right? Because the airbags are basically this big explosive. So recycling cars is really a challenge. We talk about design for recycling. You want to be able to pull a whole car apart 
and you have to go in and remove the airbags. Well, it used to be there was just one airbag. Now in modern cars, there are five to seven airbags, and there's no information. The auto manufacturers are not telling the recyclers how many airbags there are and how to separate them. I was at BMW's recycling facility, and there's this fancy machine. They plug into the car, and they let me push the button, and I detonated all the airbags at once. It was really cool. And then I said, hey, sir, are you selling that to all the independent uh, junkyards? And they said, no, why would we do that? I was like, well, maybe so they could recycle them safely. And they're like, no, 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 we do, we do it safely here. I was like, okay, how many BMWs do you recycle? Does BMW recycle a year? They recycle 30,000 cars a year. BMW is making globally 3 million cars a year. So they're developing tools to handle things correctly in their facilities. They don't make it available to anybody else. Well, going back to the energy question, you, you know, you're about to take breath. What were you going to say? Well, I was going to say, <laughs> Apple does the same thing. Any chance I have to point at Apple? Okay, Apple has this fancy recycling robot. Does anybody know Apple's robot's name? Okay, a they named their robot Liam, I think after Liam Neeson. Uh, their, their, their recycling robot is supposed to be fancy and recycle all these things, but it doesn't actually work. <laughs> It only recycles, in theory, a few, a few specific devices. So these companies are able to say, well, we have this fancy recycling process that works, so it's OK to consume things. Recycling can be an excuse for all of us to say, well, you know, we bought the product up front, but because it can be recycled, it's OK. It's not OK. There's so much raw material going into these things. We're so bad at recycling them. We need to work on figuring out the upstream problem, which is the, the fundamental problem is the amount of consumption that we are doing as a society and the types of products that we are consuming without realizing what the plan is. If everybody in the world consumed at the rate that all of us do, we need 13 Earths worth of resources. It's not going to work, and recycling isn't going to save us. Nick. <laughs> what about the question of energy? If it, if it takes you a gigantic amount of energy, and we're talking in South Australia, so there is a limited amount of supply, <laughs> what it, can you in the building industry do the kinds of things you described and have the energy affordable to do them? I think it's still possible to do that because at the end of the day, any kind of materials or products that are used within the construction industry, they already have what is known as embodied energy or operational energy. For operational energy, that's normally used when the building is being used during its life cycle. And for the embodied energy, it's when uh, the products are being used, I think, when it's been uh, produced and maintenance and so on. But coming back to what Vina had said in terms of using um, you know, recyclable material and so on, all we need to be thinking, in even just the entire stakeholders, how can we then be able to come up with some sustainable materials? Even in terms of concrete, there are some other ways that you could add some aggregates or even things like fly ash and come up with new materials. So it's just a matter of being innovative by adding other stuff to, to the concrete and bring it to the natural aggregate. We all know that we like things that are within its virgin status from the material perspective. People normally, when they look at any substitute goods, there's that stigma that, ooh, I don't want to use that because it's recyclable. I'm going to throw it and so on. So we need to change our mindset and think in terms of how it might be affecting the actual uh, society from the ecological footprint and the energy footprint and so on. Bina, what about aluminium? Is it worth... You know, the energy that's contained in aluminium, mm. how do we do the equation on that? Well, that's uh, the energy part of it is a really, really excellent question, Robin, because, I mean, when we talk about recycling, we've got to remember that what we are doing is not just actually recycling it because it's a material resource. Well, actually, I'd like to think about it um, waste as a packet of material, but it's also a packet of renewable energy. Now, I know this is kind of weird in the way I'm kind of talking about it, but just bear with me for one moment. If Using Robin's question as an example, if you actually think about the amount of energy that you put into making aluminium in the first place, if you were to take that aluminium that you had made and put it back into making new products, you would be saving more than 90% of energy in doing that. So you can imagine that with every material, if you are really, really conscious of the fact that I can actually save energy and waste at the same time, 
I only have to be really clever and innovative in the way I think about its reform back into a new product. You could actually make that argument about so many different types of materials. So I think the energy part of that equation is something we've ignored so far because we've focused on, yes, it's waste, and yes, it goes to landfill, and yes, we're all conscious of the fact that we don't want to put stuff away into landfill. But if we can suddenly start to put dollar values on the fact that this could save us so much energy, we've actually created a whole new way of thinking. And so that's what I'm really super excited about, being able to make all kinds of new materials, whether it's metals, uh, different types of copper-based alloys from e-waste. We make copper alloys into little micro particles directly from e-waste. We save energy because we make it at temperatures that are a lot, lot lower. Yes, you've said actually you get more of these minerals from that kind of recycling than you get from the ores in the first place. <laughs> That's right. And so here's, here's this incredible irony. I mean, we talk about, you know, digging things out of the ground and getting the ores, and, and everyone's aware of the fact that there's a certain level of efficiency attached to that, and we all accept it's not perfect. But if you actually compare that to recycling and getting copper-based alloys, for example, from, from e-waste, as opposed to mining copper resources out of the ground, you actually can produce use 10 times more copper out of circuit boards because they contain about 10, 20% copper compared to your 2, 3% copper that you would get out of ores. And that's not to mention the amount of energy that you have to put into mining the ores out of the ground and processing it and, and basically getting to the form of metal that you want. So the whole irony of the fact that we're talking about waste out of whether it's e-waste or whatever as this bad thing, uh, well, if you don't do the right thing by it, it's really, really bad, as, as you were referring to earlier, the, the Radio National Program. But the realities are with, with the right technology, sustainable technologies, you can actually not only deliver energy benefits, but you can deliver benefits for society as well. By the way, what happens to the aluminium cans we recycle so steadfastly? Yes, so in fact, um, a lot of the things that are nice and clean and pure, like the cans, those are the obvious candidates for recycling. So when you've got metals that come in that form, uh, the, the right thing to do is to indeed recycle that, put it back into aluminium smelters. And that's what happens to it, And it? that's exactly what happens to it. Because, of course, why would you not do it? You're saving 90% of their energy. I mean, if someone said to you that in all of those circuit boards... I've got the opportunity to save more than 50% of the energy in making those copper-based alloys, and I would be able to generate high-quality copper-based alloys and generate three or four times the number of jobs out of recycling those circuit boards. You would kind of go, well, that's a no-brainer. Hang on, why aren't we doing it? You know, so, yeah. Why aren't we doing it? What, why aren't we recycling more? I mean, this is this is a challenge. It's it's substantially a challenge of material collection. Um, it, you know, it's interesting if you if you look at with cell phones, uh, most of the cell phones that we have ever manufactured in the history of the world are sitting in cupboards and drawers. <laughs> All of it's us have uh, 25 million in it, Australia only. It's it's phenomenal. We manufactured globally about two billion cell phones last year. It's 500 pounds of raw material per phone. Multiplied by two billion phones, you see we've dug a giant hole in the earth to manufacture all the the electronics that we Say have. Say that figure again. How much to make one cell phone? Five hundred pounds of raw material to make an eight ounce you know, three you know, three hundred gram cell phone. Did you all know that? It's Amazing, a massive, it? massive amount of raw material, uh, and and you you have all of this embodied energy. If if you look at like it, it takes fifty gallons of, of fresh water that's destroyed to make one microchip. And there's no way to recycle that microchip, right? You're, you're going to grind it up and you're going to end up ah, with but sand. Wait, wait, we might be able to. Well, you might be able to get small <laughs> fractions of the metal, but oh. most of it is <laughs> silicon and germanium oh, and hey, elements that aren't really It's all not about the quantity. It's about the value that's there in those okay. metals. So. Yeah, just piggy banking on what Vina had said, I think you said something about value, isn't it? Instead of the quality, as long as you can be able to capture the value and keep that material or the product in the flow, then at l it means that we are on a winning formula. So let's forget about the landfill for now and just continue keeping those materials and products in what is known as the secular flow of economy, then that is the right way of going about it. Yeah, absolutely. 
So let, let's take a step back from the environmental impact and, and talk about reuse. So you can take a cell phone, you can actually take all the pieces of a phone out and you can repurpose them. So the cell phone chip or the baseband processor that, that's in a cell phone has three to five dollars in patent licensing that's paid to make every single chip. So if you shred that, you lose all of that economic value and that's just in the, the patent license where if you can take that chip out and use it in something else. There's a phenomenal amount of value. So what we need to do is figure out how do we, if we're going to go to all the environmental impact of manufacturing products, we need to make them last as long as possible. Oh, look, life uh, and extending life of product is absolutely core to all of this discussion. I mean, you really want to be able to extend the life of these products. You want to get, you know, and, and we were talking about earlier, you know, what is it that you want in terms of the value? Maybe plug your... Closer like that. So I suppose, I mean, what we want to be able to do is deliver the right value by effectively making sure that the things that we have in terms of our... He's giving you a demonstration right there. <laughs> Let's see if he can repair this for us, shall we? <laughs> um, but I suppose, I mean, the point that we've made about the value for, for different types of materials, if you've got greedy corporations who are not going to give you rights to their patents. You can either sit back and go, look, we can all get bogged down in trying to convince large corporates to be able to be a bit more generous, or we can take the more practical approach and go, hey, we can be really, really smart, and we can understand how to get the value out of these end-of-life products, extend life, get more value, create new resources. And for, for us in Australia, if we can actually create new resources of valuable metals, there's a lot of platinum and palladium and a lot of these highly precious metals that are locked away. Of course, the large corporates are going to turn around and say, sorry, we're not going to share with you all of that. Doesn't matter. We know that we're smart enough to actually get to these precious metals. So you know what? Bugger the large corporates. We can do it ourselves. I'll tell you why. We can do it ourselves. <laughs> Yeah, just coming in, I think we were speaking earlier on about the intellectual, you know, IP and so on. I think that is the problem that is facing the construction industry because at the end of the day, it all boils down to information. If you had some knowledge about certain thing, would you want to share it with your competitor? Absolutely not, isn't it? You'd rather be the first one on the market and so on. So if we would then be able to share that information easily among all the stakeholders in the process. It might be the client, it might be the designers, it might be the manufacturers. Then we could at least be heading towards solving some solutions or providing some solutions. So everything lies within the information. And with information comes also uncertainty. And also once it comes to whether do we have to recycle or not, again, it boils down to trying to ascertain the quality of that product. If we can convince, if I was able to convince the people who are sat here that any of the salvage materials, they are good, you can use them, then my philosophy is that let's just try and avoid sending stuff to the landfill. But to do that, we have to change our mindset and also change our perception about the usage of those salvage products. Right, and if I can build on that, the information is so critical. We have a world of all of these incredibly complex products, and the information in order to be able to repair or reuse them is going to have to come from the person who designed them in the first place. So I started I fix it because I was trying to fix my laptop, and I was searching on Google, and I couldn't find repair information for it. I muddled through the repair, and I kind of botched it. I mostly got it working, and I did a little more research later, and I learned that the reason that the repair manual for my iBook wasn't on the Internet was because Apple's lawyers had sent threatening letters to every single person that had published the information, telling them to take it off the internet. And we found that there is a systematic campaign on, be, on the part of the manufacturers to prevent this information from getting out there. And they say that the reason is that they're afraid that people will use this repair information to copy their products, but in actuality, it's a form of planned obsolescence. They want to prevent all of us from knowing how to fix things. Uh, and it causes problems for recyclers, too, because they don't know how to separate out the different types of materials. Yeah, can I just chip in, Robin? Okay, Nick. Yeah, and again, because I'm speaking from the construction industry perspective, or building, or whatever you may choose to call it, that brings us to the notion of procurement. There are various procurement strategies that you can put in place where you bring together all the necessary stakeholders and you're able to share that information readily among the parties. 
So there are ways that you can actually go about Mm. Right, and it's it's those problem. those yeah. information flows. It's getting getting that because we we're pretty good at moving materials around the world. We're not very good at having the information about those materials follow along with them. Yes, so indeed. Well, I'm going to ask for questions from you in a minute, but first I want to come to something that uh, Vina said. Um, I think you may remember last year we were all talking about. I think a certain prime minister was talking about innovation and being <laughs> agile. Well. What about the corporations? Without naming and blaming, what if you had name and fame of those who are doing well? What do you think about that? Are there any good corporations doing it now and doing it well? Oh, look, absolutely, Robin. And you're absolutely right in raising that point, right? As much as I have said, you know, bugger the ones who are the greedy corporates, uh, there are equally good ones who we should be celebrating. Um, and I think to me, that's an important part of the thinking because precisely the good ones who want to do the right thing are the ones who are also supporting R&D. They're supporting R&D not because they want to make um, huge profits or whatever. Yes, if profits come down the line, that's great. But they're supporting R&D um, in the early stages of R&D, particularly because they want to do the right thing by the environment. They want to be able to create new and innovative solutions through supporting university's research in a collaborative manner. And to me, that is such an important part of generating new ideas, but also taking new ideas into the marketplace. You know, I mean, yes, in the university environment, you can do all the R&D, but you do need corporate partners who are willing to be bold and brave. Um, and indeed, this is where, you know, and it you've is got important. Them. You've and, got them. and we do. So, yeah. <laughs> so in fact, if you remember when I was on your show, Robin, and, and we were talking about the ARC Green Hub that we have at UNSW, um, as part of this Green Hub, we've got um, a corporation called Mollycop. Mollycop is in the business, uh, an Australian company, has got an international presence, producing a highly specialized uh, product. And as far as they're concerned, the fact that this product could be enhanced and without giving away, you know, all the sort of scientific details and boring you on a, on a beautiful afternoon like this, but to be able to take waste resources and to convert them into high-value, high-performing product is, is literally breaking ground when no one else in the world has shown that this can be done. And the fact that we can do this in Australia, we can do this with support of our industry partners and create a lot of world firsts in terms of products that are being made as high-performing products literally from waste means that it's, it's good for this business in the long term, but it's also good for our environment because we are using waste not just to chuck it into landfill, but indeed to be able to reform them into high-value products. An example of silicon carbide I gave you earlier uh, is a, a high-performing ceramic material. And we're doing that out of using waste plastics that come out of cars. So our green hub is all about using you know, waste materials from cars. So if you take the waste plastics from cars, you can make high performance ceramic materials. Now you would sort of sit there and go, huh? But the fact is that all of that science is something that is being funded through Australian corporates who believe that doing you know, cutting edge R&D is going to be in the long term good for our planet. And that's why we're doing it. That's why we're doing it. Right, questions, hands up. And uh, the microphone at the front. Thanks, Robin. Um, so let's say name and, sh name and fame is, is a great plan, but companies do like making profits, and, and without a cradle-to-grave responsibility for waste, why would they stop making those profits? Do we need something in a legislative, uh, regulatory environment, or will this just happen naturally through those innovative companies? I have been trying to negotiate with these companies for the last decade to try to come to some kind of consensus. I've worked on uh, in a lot of the incentive, the green environmental standards for electronics. I've been involved in developing every single one uh, over the last 10 years. The companies are intransigent. They do not want to share it. So we're talking about this information flow. They are not willing to allow the information to flow. Uh, and so we've dis we've come to the conclusion, this is we in the environmental movement and in the repair world, all the independent repair folks that are out there trying to keep things fixed, that the companies aren't going to come along willingly and we have to pass legislation. And so there is a wave of right to repair legislation that's being introduced across Europe and the United States this year uh, where it will force the manufacturers to make to sell parts and to make repair information available. Uh, there was a hearing yesterday in Nebraska 
Yes, yeah, so this is a very exciting trend that we're saying basically if you're going to make a product that's complex, that requires specialized information to repair, then you got to make that available to the customers. So that's an important part. And of course, you know, governments have to play a role. And in, a, in an Australian context, I've been involved in a few different conversations that happen where government, you know, obviously has people like myself and organizations around a round table contributing to what kind of practical solutions we could put in place, what kind of legislative framework we need to have. But I think it's a collaborative effort. It's got to be a collaborative effort. We can't just sort of sit back and go, well, okay, we just need to have the problem that the government's going to fix. We need to have corporations, we need to have research organizations working together with community groups to be able to you know, address these challenges. So in, in the example of that corporation that I was giving you that's using waste as a raw material as part of its manufacturing of this high performance product. Now, as far as that company is concerned, they're not making that waste in the first place. It's about taking the waste that's available from cars. Now, they could sit back and go, hey, that's not our problem. We didn't create that in the first place, so why should we bother? But the realities are they do want to play a role in developing new solutions. So they're part of the green hub where the philosophy is, doesn't matter where the waste is coming from. Hey, we're all contributing to that waste, right? I mean, it's all the, the plastics that comes from cars when cars come to the end of their life. So the fact that we can take this collective responsibility, take the waste plastics, and use that as a raw material for manufacturing. And that's what this green manufacturing hub is all about. It's not about just saying, look, it's not my responsibility, but collectively saying, as a corporate, I'm willing to be bold and brave and take the risk. But hey, with that risk is a high reward. If they can actually successfully produce this innovative product for the first time in the world using waste materials, they'll be global leaders in the space. So it's very much about securing their long-term business strategy of being, you know, global domination. So I'd go, hey, yes for Australian corporates who want to be global leaders in the space in which that they operate, and, and we want to be part of that solution. Hello. Oh. Um, uh, one of the things I, the recent waste seminar I went to, uh, they brought up the issue of uh, energy from waste. There's a lot of um, waste facilities actually burning uh, waste to get energy. Uh, but one of the, the problems with that is a lot of toxins and stuff are released. And they actually put forward the idea of actually landfill, a lot of this stuff, is actually sequestering carbon. And it was another opportunity, rather than um, get releasing all the toxins and getting energy, actually putting it in the ground if we've got the, the spaces. And it's one way of sequestering carbon. Well, there might be enough carbon, but then the problem lies in in terms of the amount of land that we have, isn't it? If we, if we were to go with your argument that you know you'd be able to put that waste in the in the landfill, let's think in terms of the depleting natural resources. You know, so we need to be cognizant of the fact that if we follow that route, then at this rate we're going to end up, you know running out of land and in the process would be land, you know, running out of the natural resources and so on. But coming back to the earlier question about uh, what, what you had asked and whether the government can do anything about it and so on. When we look at the uh, South Australian uh, perspective, we need to take into consideration that one, of course the regulations, they do come into play. Strangely enough, one of the biggest clients of the construction industry within South Australia, it's, it's the government itself. But they are not even keen to use the salvaged products because of the issue of quality. So it's back to the issue of if we could at least give people the certainty that there is some quality within these, or coming up with the necessary codes and so on. So all these problems that we are talking about, they will pale in significance. Next question. Um, I take my e-waste to a local recycling depot that says we do e-waste. How do I know that that's going somewhere that's going to be recycled properly? Yeah, again, a very, very good question because I think all of us, you know, think like what you're suggesting, which is 
you know, we can, as individual citizens, do the right thing, um, but we want to have some assurance. So absolutely, I think the onus should be on local governments who are encouraging people to do the right thing, but to also provide information that this is what happens and provide that full value chain. If indeed it's being converted into a valuable metal at the end of the day, um, then let's hear about it. You know, why not? Because we're putting in all of that effort. We want to know if the plastics are being burnt away in some ridiculous manner through this, this revelation that was made on, on ABC. Is that the case? Or is it really being done properly? Um, are there sustainable technologies um, that are enabling us to you know, ultimately do the right thing by the waste? And to me, to have a, a narrow-minded approach in these things where we're going to just hide behind sort of you know, uh, all kinds of rules is a bad thing. I mean, we need to be able to be honest and say, hey, you know what? We don't have a solution right now for plastics, and let's make sure that we work with universities and research organizations to do the right thing, uh, but let's not do the harmful practices uh, that we hear about in the media. So I think the first and foremost thing should be about transparency and having an own op open and honest conversation. Um, if you can develop products from waste, like we're, we're working towards developing products from waste plastics that come from e-waste, or indeed metallic products that could be produced, then why not let's share that information and share that knowledge and let everyone benefit from that. But so in, in the knowledge that the recycling system isn't perfect, the goal would be to get the material used in the highest and best use, which is, if at all possible, find, find some way to repurpose it and use it before you finally end up recycling it. I agree with the, with the point that you've raised. Obviously, if we can be able to convince the a public or at least find some mechanisms for communicating with them in terms of the benefits of waste management and so on, then that will go a long way because that is one of the inhibitors or the barriers to people using salvage products because they don't know and that might you know, lead you to asking the question as to how do I know that whatever I'm taking to the skip is going to be used in this manner. If you have a time, just read up the article in the latest advertiser, sorry, in the latest uh, new uh, ad light review. I've done an, uh, an article there, it's called The Road to Waste Reduction. And within that, I have outlined some of the principles. And one of the principles alludes to something that you've just mentioned, communication, and also communicating the benefits of waste management, making sure that the society, they're also on board in terms of what happens to the waste that they take to the escapes. Yes, and in the background briefing uh, program, they actually talked about how some of the people had to pick up this stuff, that brand new equipment, working equipment, was being chucked away, possibly because it's last year's model. You know, last year is so old-fashioned. You have to have something new. You're all neophiliacs. Another question here, please. Uh, we've heard what the corporations should be doing, and and your point about we shouldn't just we just basically shouldn't buy, be buying too much stuff in the first place. Just wondering, what are the other sort of key things that that the public can do as individuals um, if they're already say re recycling e-waste? So oh. sure. So uh, the average family has 28 electronic devices in their home. So that's a lot. Uh, so I like to say uh, y you can really shave, uh, you can really save the earth through sheer laziness. Just stop buying new stuff when when something breaks or bre breaks. You know, take take a bit of time and fix it. Oftentimes it's faster to fix something than to go to the store, get a new one, and then deal with recycling the old one. Uh, so uh, you know, take take a gamble on that. Another thing is we have all of these wonderful fix-it clinics and repair cafes that are popping up around the country. There's there's dozens of them around Australia, and you can go and 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 bring your broken stuff. You bring a lamp or a kettle and sit down and hang out with some folks and learn how to fix something. Uh, they're they're phenomenal kind of community. Uh, events that are that are really grassroots and spreading all over the place and it's been really exciting to see the kinds of things that people are learning Carl uh, young people involved as well absolutely so what ends up happening is that the young folks teach the old folks how to fix the electronics and the old folks teach the young folks how to fix everything else <laughs> <laughs> and I think that works out pretty well next question please uh, thanks guys um do we have the technology to create a, a fully recyclable, uh, recyclable cell phone? Is, is Absolutely not. We're nowhere close. We're decades away. 
Decades. Yeah, out of, out of you know, 50 elements uh, on the periodic table that are in your cell phone, we can recover maybe 12 in recycling. And the thermodynamics around like recovering rare earths uh, just doesn't work yet. We, we'd like to, but the materials are, are too densely populated. You need to separate them out somehow okay. mechanically. So I'm going to disagree with respect with my fellow panelists. And as a material scientist, I'm going to tell you that uh, you know when, when you talk about how do you actually produce material products that you need, and we were referring to the rare earths in this instance, if you've got rare earth oxides, uh, what you have to do is just think about them. I mean, this is where, you know, with our work on material science, we have to understand the reaction conditions under which we produce um, certain types of oxides and certain types of materials. So what we haven't yet discovered how to do doesn't mean that it cannot be done. And in fact, if anything, to me, I'd love to be able to refer to my good friend John, who's waiting here in the audience and has been giving me company as a metallurgist. We love to think about the fact that we understand the full spectrum of materials that can be processed up to very, very high temperatures. And of course, you would use temperatures wisely, but the fact that you can target some rare earth oxides out of a lot of magnets and difficult materials can be done. That's exactly the kind of research we're doing at UNSW as part of the work in understanding new scientific discoveries that enable us to produce some of these really complex materials. But the challenge is doing it by taking recycled and waste materials that people are putting away into landfill. I'd love to be able to think that in the future we're actually going and mining our landfills and going, oh my gosh, yeah. how do we put that stuff in there in the first place? You know? Well, so so. This is the difference between a scientist and an engineer. So the scientist oh. says it is <laughs> theoretically yeah, possible. I'm an engineer. <laughs> okay. But it's there but it's not practical today. We need we need better technologies, we need more research to happen, and we're gonna get there. You need, there is no question, this is where, of course, I love Robin and his show, that w we are just breaking the boundaries of what we might say can't be done. What is seen as impossible today is possible tomorrow. Yeah. John, do you want to come over here and say something? No, you don't. <laughs> Next question, please. Who's got a mic? Yeah, I've have. Uh, we talked about uh, name and fame, and, or, and, or sorry, name and shame and name and fame. Kyle, is it true that uh, when you built your uh, electronic tr screwdriver uh, to uh, fix an Apple, an iPhone, that Apple changed the screw? <laughs> uh, th so they, they created this, this strange screw initially, and uh, they've actually kept with it. So it's a, we call it the pentalobe. It's a five-pointed screw. Uh, we've, been, we've been making that screw available. They, they've made several different screws, but they've kept that same one in the iPhone. There's a different one in the MacBooks. There's a different screw in the, in the Apple Watch. Uh, so I have been very successfully kept in the business of making screwdrivers, <laughs> and I'll keep at it. We have a we call it our 64-bit driver kit, and it's got lots and lots of different bits. We have a special bit for the Nintendo, so we're working at making sure. But it's it's this cat and mouse game where they're constantly coming out with new screws, and I make the screwdriver. Uh, practical question with the phones: Is there one company or one phone which is in relation to what you're talking about, which is uh, heading in that direction? You know, you're sort of talking about right, so is there a positive example? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, so there's a wonderful organization out of Amsterdam called Fairphone, and they're working on making a phone that is ethically sourced, that is straightforward to disassemble for repair, and that's easy to recycle. They're a or tremendous organization, and they actually came to us and said, hey, we want people to know how to fix this thing. Will you help us? And we said, sure. So we helped them write the repair manual, and then they actually include the repair manual for the phone on the phone. It's exciting, yeah. So Fairphone is a tremendous organization, and they are they're making great strides, and, and we need more companies like them. Patagonia is also doing similar things in the clothing space. So there are a few examples of companies that are doing the right thing, and we need more companies like them. Um, watching the Four Corners program the other day, it seems to suggest that there was something magical happening, or could be happening with plastics. Um, from an environmental point of view, is it too late from an environmental point of view to bring plastics back into control if we poison the earth permanently from that point of view? Um, and uh, is there something that's going to eat up plastics to its Yes, the plastic gyres in the ocean, which are gigantic, 
can we deal with plastic? Um, you know, look, I mean, the reality is that, and you're right, Robin, I mean, the problem is already out there, right? So we need to be able to find a sensible way to be able to transform that into something that we can use without creating more harm. And I think that's really the critical component. So if we actually understand the nature and the complex nature of, of these plastics that are already out there in the environment, by collecting that, bringing it back so I think the corporates that were responsible for a lot of those products that ended up in that space in the first place should work with you know, government bodies. Let's bring it back wherever, whether they are cruise shipping lines or whoever sort of out there. Um, let's sort of work collectively. Let's all help each other because the science in terms of its transformation um, could be developed. It's how do you practically arrive at that outcome where you get it out of harm's way, whether it's about the sea creatures and, and what we're doing to the ocean in terms of... So, I mean, you've heard about things like microbeads and so on that are out there already. Um, the realities are that we could well be developing useful solutions with those plastic microbeads um, and, and keeping it away from, from causing more harm. Um, so that's what we would like to be able to ultimately do. Yes, it, it, but it's so hard to get the stuff back out of the ocean. So I, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're going to continue to be. I see all these really innovative techniques for trying to get it out. But let's stop putting stuff into the ocean first. Final question from me, as we've only got a couple of minutes. We've been talking about the corporations and the universities and innovation like that. Kyle hinted at what the consumer could do. Could you just end up by talking about us, individuals, you know? What sort of responsibility do we have? What would you like to see us do to make the situation better? So I'd love to, uh, one simple example could well be that, you know, the longevity of the products, and I think we were talking about that earlier. You know, if we all individually purchased less, and the way, of course, we can purchase less is to be able to make sure that we extend the life of our own products and things that we use at home. Uh, so yes, I've got my phone, which is more than sort of five, six years old now. Um, and I think to me, it's a simple way I can actually kind of lead a little bit by example in my own family. So, you know, I mean, we talk about that sort of individual solution. Uh, I'd love to be able to imagine that there are a whole range of other products. I think the other big part of what we tend to live in a disposable sort of community, I want to mention particularly clothes, I think is a big part of that throwaway society that we live in. Enormous amount of waste that we end up putting into landfill. Um, so I'd love to be able to think that we purchase clothes of good quality that we can kind of keep for a long, long time. Kyle, given that, you know, when there's a new phone on sale, guys line up queue round the block. I'm in line for with 24 them. hours, and you're one of them. <laughs> ah! Yes, uh, however, I, we actually, I fix up flies to Australia every time a new iPhone comes out, and we buy it because all the new stuff comes out here first. So what we actually do is we, we fly, fly here, we get in line, we buy the new thing, we never turn it on, we just take it apart, and we tell people what's inside, and then we give you a bit of insight, we say, this is how easy or hard it is to fix things, right? Because you can't tell from the outside, is an iPhone or an iPad easier to fix? It turns out the iPad is, who knew, or the iPhone is, who knew? Uh, so... I 1,000% I agree with you that we have to be buying better products. We have to be providing signals to companies to spend a bit more on fewer quality products. The trick is f identifying which ones. One interesting way to identify that is to look at the resale value of products over time. So if you're looking and you have a couple different options, like which car should I buy, which, wh wh you know, right, which jacket should I buy, look at the resale value of that product three, four years down the line, and that's the best signal as to whether that's a good product or not. So you actually want to buy the things that are going to be the best investment for you because those are the things that are durable. So the most environmentally profoundly effective organizations in the world are organizations like eBay and Gumtree. Right? It's getting our products out there and reselling them. So if, if, if you want one thing that you can do that will improve the planet more that you could do today, go through your closet, find your old stuff that you're not using anymore, and sell it. Nick, finally, can you sell a house? Well, yes, you can sell the house. That's fine. But if you're going to demolish your house and you want to build another house, again, I'm more of an, uh, 
an advocate of not sending the stuff to the landfill and so on, think of how else you can use that. There are a lot of things. Let's, for example, think of landscaping. You know, you could even crush the bricks and use them as part of the landscaping or use them part of the pavement and so on. So there's a lot more that we can take as opposed to letting things go away to the landfill. So what I can, maybe my take home point is that even a salvage product is good. We don't have to be focusing on new stuff all the time. As long as they maintain the same quality or they have an equivalent quality and you can be able to use them for, some, for something else, then that would be the right way to go. Thank you all very much indeed, and thank you.